Initially, I predicted that Fox's and Locksmith Animation's feature Ron's Gone Wrong was going to get a lot of comparisons to Sony's Mitchells vs. the Machines. I pronounced it right! But while there are some similarities, even direct ones, like both showcasing minor dust-ups around an all-encompassing technology corporation in a world where that is the only one that everyone uses with no competition, and features robots where getting broken gives them personalities, making them ultimately both rip-offs of XR from Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. But that's pretty much it. Run is absolutely its own respectable entity, and much like the plucky little robot itself, the the movie has its own unique and lovable charm, but ultimately does worse when it tries to fit in with everyone else. Barney is the only kid in his school who doesn't have a bubble bot, a product advertised to be your best friend, but in function really is just a walking talking tablet. After Barney's teacher does something that should get her fired and his father showcases the frequent parental hypocrisy of not wanting his child to become reliant on a device when he himself needs it to do his job, he manages to get Barney a thrown out broken Bebot that Barney nearly instantly dismisses for not being able to do everything that he tells it, but soon warms up to it when it's revealed that its parental controls are off and ergo it can beat up his bullies for him, and thus starts an endearing story of friendship and questioning our reliance on technology for it. At its core, the growing bond and interaction between Barney and Ron is fantastic, showing a lot of growth between the two as they navigate what it takes to be a good friend, highlighted by the theme of friendship is a two-way street. Barney is your regular shy boy, but in a nice change for the practical, outside of one a-hole, it's not because every single one of his classmates is unnecessarily cruel to him. He's just on his own, and his insecurity keeps him from reaching out to others unless he feels like he has something in common with them, or in hope that technology will replace all of the emotional risk of putting yourself out there while also highlighting that just having the newest hit product, even when it functions correctly, doesn't guarantee that it's going to solve all your problems, or erase all possibilities of loneliness. And in the realm of adorable fictional robots, Ron certainly is another one of those. He's a good one, but he is another one. He's certainly adorable with a lot of great repeating gags. When the movie is just on the two of them, the movie is great. But then everyone else in the film tends to be a bit one note. Barney does have his loving connections with his father and grandmother, who admittedly leans a little hard on the Russian archetype. But then at school, it's the popular girl vlogger, who thankfully they do not try to pull a romantic arc with, and of course the jackass prankster bully. And as mentioned, it does occasionally have to do the movie thing, where we need to break away from the genuinely engaging character moments for more bombastic, chaotic forms of conflict. We need Ron to create a massive crisis at school, which leads to the company needing to recall him, and of course the third act breakup and an elaborate heist to break into a massive technology corporation. But as it tends to be, following the beats doesn't make it bad, it just makes it regular. And the breakup felt just a little bit more fresh by happening just a little bit earlier in the film and not lasting very long. It has its share of the lowbrow kid humor, but not to an obnoxious cringe level. And otherwise, a lot of the comedy works. There really is a lot of good setup and payoff in this film that shows off how generally well it's constructed. And I don't think I heard a single piece of copyrighted music that I can remember. But if there is a low, low point, it is the movie's antagonist, where the hip, young, hoodie-wearing, friendly face of the megatech conglomerate is totally pure of intentions, with the customer's best interests at heart, and totally owes up to his mistakes, not to be confused with the older, corrupt, evil business partner who communicates solely in sentences involving the word shareholders, profit, and data mining, and was also just willing to let a child die for absolutely no reason at all. This is where Mitchell's unabashedly succeeds, where the friendly face of the company was also a bit of a corrupt idiot, and the world-conquering AI had the barest amount of sympathy and at least had a sense of humor. Yeah, this is the kind of one-dimensional villain that makes me go, yeah, let's go back to the Twitched villains. At least there I know that the writers thought about this character for longer than two minutes. In comparison, Ericole is like top tier 1D antagonist. Now, quick beef, 
One particular negative review dwelled on it being very anti-technology and saying we need to put down our phones and go play in the woods. To which, no, it really wasn't saying that in BT dubs. The sentiment of blaming technology for kids not playing in nature may be mildly accurate, but really it's because now we're much more set on this idea that children should be supervised when they go outside and adults don't want to go outside with them. Parents give their children this technology so they'll sit still and be quiet. Besides, the scene where Barney and Ron go into the woods is because there's no cameras and they can't be followed. And in the same scene, it showcases exactly why we don't send kids into the woods alone. If there is anything this movie is critical of, like Mitchell's, it's the all-powerful data mining tech corporation. Which, yes, be critical of that. But it is more about regulation and not relying on that technology for everything. Because yes, it is suggesting that this technology has made making friends slightly more difficult, but it's more intricate than just owning the hip new thing that everyone else is into, which has always been a thing. The film's opening scene is the initial demonstration of the B-Bots, during which the bots takes the children's likes and uses that to introduce them to other children in the same room with similar interests. And that's a decent idea. And it's not too different from how many real friendships starts with some sort of common ground. But the implied drawback is that assumedly every child uses the Bebop's friendship algorithm solely to choose their friends for them. And if Barney doesn't have a Bebop, and hence he's not in the Bebop system, that's why he doesn't have any friends. And even the friends he had before no longer hang out with him, supposedly since their algorithm sent them in the direction of other friends that they had more in common with. Practically, it is a tad hyperbolic, but metaphorically, it does highlight the danger of the algorithm, especially since there are kids with Bebots that apparently just didn't get matched up with anyone. That tied with its two-street friendship philosophy is also frowning on the algorithm that if it only sends you what you already like, you're never challenged and you never learn to compromise. But then there's its ending, which is just one of those, yeah, I get what you were going for thematically, but practically, it makes less and less sense the longer you think about it. Aside from the thing that happens, feels very similar to a thing that happened earlier in the film, only then it was bad, but now it's okay? I mean, there are some differences, but I just feel like they kind of wanted to end on a bittersweet note. And as said, the company advertises the bot like it's a friend, but kids mostly use it as a product, how it kind of should be used. But the entire point of the film is to treat our products like they're our friends? Um, that feels kind of backwards. I mean, it'd be different if this was a story about whether or not to give AIs free will, but since we are far off from producing self-aware AI, this is about teaching children how to be real friends by giving their iPhones the ability to say no, as well as the question on whether it was right to make this decision for everyone. And okay, this is textbook pointless nitpick, but you don't really need to be a computer scientist to see that for all of this obsessing about Ron's unique code, um, the problem was never his software. His hardware is what broke, and all it really did was turn off his parental controls and not connect him to the internet. Really, we could talk about the ending and its implications for like another hour, but I enjoyed Ron's Gone Wrong, regardless of how kind of difficult it is to say, but at least appreciate that it's not another generic one-word title. But if family-friendly techno-cautionary tales aren't your thing, or some minor sci-fi premiere that nobody's heard of, there were two other major animated premieres this weekend on Netflix. One was season one of Inside Job, which preemptively I apologize if I accidentally call it Inside Out multiple times. A workplace comedy about a team that covers up all of the totally real conspiracy theories while also attempting to run the country in service of a cult of Bill Cipher worshippers. And with all of its triangle and secret society subject matter, most likely refer to this as the new Alex Hirsch show. But he mostly serves as executive producer alongside actual series creator Shion Takauchi, who is a veteran writer and animator on many animated favorites. While I admit that I desire slightly more innovation in the adult animation scene, Inside Job is a very bingeable fun comedy. It feels very Futurama in its presentation and delivery with just a lot more swearing. And it contains my new favorite intro that I watch every single time. And I greatly appreciate a story that says almost every conspiracy is real, but the flat earthers are still relentless idiots. 
The one questionable aspect that may or may not get fixed in the future is that the show currently is very Reagan-centric. Very rarely gives the spotlight to any of her other co-workers other than Brett. But for the moment, I enjoy all of them in their existing minor roles, and kudos that you can make a faceless character like Mike have so much personality. The other major premiere is Maya and the Three from the creative team that made The Book of Life, which admittedly I haven't finished yet, but can already tell that my first impression of the first trailer is already proven false. As some commenters already guessed, the rebellious princess who wants to be a warrior but is put down by the guys for being a girl is something that only happens in that one scene, and in general is a pretty minor point, as halfway through the very first episode, it instantly escalates when this emo boy band looking mofo suddenly shows up on his skeleton horse, going, hey Maya, the god of war is gonna sacrifice you because you're actually the offspring of the goddess of death. Say what now? And it gets bigger from there, as Maya needs to go on a journey to obtain allies from the neighboring kingdoms to fight the god of war. I am very interested to see where this goes, and in the meantime, this series is absolutely stunning to look at, taking full advantage of the CGI medium to create an immaculately detailed and decorated fantastical world, with some top-tier character design. And its action is kind of extraordinary. And I have already heard that the ending has gotten some people crying. My one minor issue is that it does have a little bit of the MLP movie problem where it spends a lot of time talking about how awesome friendship is, then showing it. Oh, and Young Justice Season 4 suddenly dropped out of nowhere recently and updating Thursdays. And to clarify a mistake that I made in my last video, turns out that Blue Period and Comey Can't Communicate are actually not in Netflix jail, they're being updated weekly for a change, and both are really good so far. So what have you guys watched recently that you've really enjoyed? And what are your current Halloween watches? Everyone have a great spooky season, and let's see how Animaniacs Season 2 goes.